Hello and welcome to the Tech Lunch Podcast, where we encourage our listeners to learn something new about tech every week. This can range from learning about new and exciting te- applications to the advancements in coding and technology. If you are always learning, you will always be a step above the rest. Take the time during lunch or during a break to listen and learn, kind of like a lunch and learn, but for the years. This podcast will open the listeners' ears to new and exciting technologies they may have not been purviewed to in the past. These topics will range from manufacturing technologies to data collection technologies and everything in between. Hello, I'm Nick. Hello, I'm Ed. Hey guys, I'm John. And this week we're going to talk about a little bit something a little different. Some of that's still on the, the same train as you know STEM like we have been. But you know, kind of going towards like the, the hobbier side of the house towards the additive manufacturing side of the house, towards a rapid prototyping side of the house, and pretty much everything in between. It's something that we can tie everything we've been talking to so far into one environment. And what I mean by that, and the subject at hand, is, uh, you know, 3D printing. And, you know, how that is, you know, the wave of the future, and also how we can tie STEM into that. You know, when I start talking about 3D printing, you know, Ed, what are you, what are you kind of thinking about from the OT standpoint? From uh, that standpoint, we're thinking about being able to explain things to people uh, physically, uh, exploited uh, views of, uh, say, a three-phase motor, mm-hmm. where they can see the different components of the motor and touch them and understand how they look and interact. So like a learning tool. A learning tool, exactly. Also, uh, we can also use that as, hey... I have a uh, handling process with a robot, and it has a fixture. And I want to try some new um, uh, points of entry to uh, grab parts. Well, I want to maybe uh, make some of these parts and see what the interference would be. Mm, uh, will, will it contact something? And then uh, lastly, I would say um, you always have to be able to uh, promote your vision to someone else. So it's always nice to be able to physically hand someone something and say, hey, with this tool, I can do this. Uh, And uh, from there, I would say uh, we would uh, turn it over to John Mm -hmm. and uh, get John's perspective. Yeah, I I mean, it's good that you say, you know, the prototyping. I I, I think that's great um, to be able to have an actual working model of something um, is is vital. And a a lot of the things that we kind of, do day to day, it's you're, you're, you're kind of convincing people, hey, this is going to work. This is how it works. This is why it works. And and being able to have that model printed um, to show that piece off and and possibly in action if, if you can get those things to work together, that, that will convince them and, and get you moving much quicker. Um, I also think about it on the other side is, is you know, sustainability um, currently – Part shortages are happening everywhere. You know, you, you probably couldn't even um, buy a Raspberry Pi if you went went down the street to a micro center. They might not even have any in stock, to be honest. Um, so, with, with that being said, if you're needing a part, a part breaks, something is um, something is hard to get. Why not make it on site? Why not have it built in the back if if it's a um, if it needs to be a polymer or, or a blend of materials? Why not? Um, and honestly, the only thing that's stopping you is, is having it um, because you can always test it. It's a prototype. Mm-hmm. It's a prototype that creates prototypes. It just keeps on giving. So I, I just think that there's so many possibilities that you can have that, that it will not only save you money, uh, but it gives you um, that opportunity not to have as much waste, um, which you know saves you even more money. So. Yeah, I, I think it's just it's just vital, honestly, moving forward into Industry 4.0, into, into anything manufacturing-wise, um, make some of those pieces on site. Now, you talk about, you know, the, the way of saving money and sustainability and stuff like that. You know, looking at it from, you know, a holistic approach, you know, from like the IT standpoint, you know, I'm always looking at a way to, you know, cut cost and, you know, save cash on the end, on, right. on the end feed. But... You know what? How much is you know the the point of entry? You know exactly. You know what what is the point of entry? You know for you know a return on that. So so you're thinking small scale. You know basics. Um, 
$200 will get you in the door. $200 will get you the printer. It even comes with a little bit of filament. It has the motherboard that can, that can read your G-code. The application to slice the G-codes free. You just download it right off the internet. Um, honestly, all the firmware is free. Go to GitHub, you can make any changes. You can request changes. You can have those conversations. That's all still free. So $200 in the door, you're producing right now. Quality, not gonna be perfect, but that comes with time. Um, and then honestly, if that's that's core, you know, do-it-yourself kit that's already been established for you, um, there's no telling how much um, or how cheap you can make it if you are making all these pieces yourself um, and, and, and all you're getting is, you know, stepper motors, um, an extruder. Um, an 8-bit board is all you need. You don't need a 32-bit or, or anything more than that. So... Uh, honestly, on that side, it's 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 not very expensive to get in the door. So the barrier to entry is is actually a decent price. Yeah. So that's actually not bad, you know, Ed. When you're thinking about it, you know, especially from a manufacturing standpoint, you know, barrier of entry of two hundred dollars with a possible return on investment, is, you know, in the excess of thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. if not more. And if you think about it, you're not really high on your IT cost at that point or your OT cost at that point. What is that? A couple of man hours, and half the time it runs by itself. So uh, it was interesting you said GCO. I, I I believe that at a two hundred dollar price point, that's a hobbyist. And when with a hobbyist, he's not limited to GCO. Mm -hmm. A hobbyist could uh, even be uh, to the point of uh, using a variable frequency drive concept, or a hobbyist could even be to the point where he can say, "Hey, I want to take GCO and make it as an algorithm, and be able to say, hey, these are the dimensions of my part.'" Hey, I've uh, created this program in Python. I've used a little bit of AI on top of it, smoothed it over with a little bit of GUI on my PC. I don't need a display. I don't really need uh, um, a whole lot of uh, secondary software. And I believe a person could actually maybe make it better. Yeah. yeah. And and what what's it? There's not much stopping you right there. Like you add a couple more pieces to that um, puzzle that you've got. You, you add a camera that's that's reading, possibly um, that's kind of taking vertices and points on your model that you're making and telling you, okay, we've got a we've got a defect here, um, so I need to increase my flow rate or I need to change my path of um, my hot end to kind of correct for any overhang or, or drop or or anything um, like if a catastrophic failure were to happen, I can recognize that stop it so that we don't waste any more filament and then notify um, whoever needs to uh, the mm -hmm. business if, if it's on in an industrial or manufacturing standpoint or if it's just at the house like like mine is just shoot me a message hey you got a critical failure we stopped it for you um, don't worry about it check the camera if you're if if you want to just to kind of get a picture of what's going on so like an MQTT so. interface is right, what right. it is MQTT and that's you know another barrier to you know our our industry 4.0 methodology is you know using what we have at hand you know it's not really a barrier it's more or less an you know an advent you know and a you know and a tie in to the the current methodology that we're using now you talk a lot about you know filament, and you know when I'm starting to think about that. You know you, you talk about what your PLAs, your TPUs, right. your PLA pluses, and stuff like that. Um, so how does that kind of roll if you think about it into like an additive manufacturing standpoint of where or rapid prototyping if you really want to you know deviate towards that route, um, you know way of doing things. So you know what does that kind of entail? So so. Um Describe additive manufacturing to me. Like, go, go deeper into that for me, because I'm thinking with a 3D printer. Um, we we, we kind of talked about it earlier, Ed. Where, where you're, so you're adding to something to make it, you know, fundamentally different or fundamentally changing that structure, right. um, and possibly even the function of that structure just by adding, you know, this polymer, that metal, or or changing even the temperature. Right. With exactly. This. So that that's what you're going for. Um, with, with those things, honestly. The most thing that you're changing on there is temperature as well as you know positioning. Uh, there's there's no limit um, to what you can do in mm -hmm. a uh, manufacturing world with industrial size pieces. Mm -hmm. um, we're we're constantly you see you see commercials about them modeling cars and like giant model cars in clay. Right. Um, that that it can be done with 
you know, some type of um, MQTT protocol that's reading you what's going on, that, right. that cameras that are kind of seeing those vertices and things like that and adjusting to whatever the user operator is yeah. putting in there. Your so. X and Y axis. Right, 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 right. You know, that, that's kind of funny because, you know, and get kind of, you know, in, in, you know, kind of interesting at the same point because right now we're 3D printing houses, rockets, you know, and everything in between. Right. You know, if you're, you know, a, a 2A fan like myself, you know, you've got people that are 3D printing, you know, the outside case of suppressors. You know, that's, you know, the Daniel Defense Wave, DD Wave does that. You know, for me, it's just, it's, 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 it's awesome, especially when we start getting into, you know, and the thing is you go from the different types of 3D printers, you know, that's where, you know, you have the filament runoff, the filament type, and then you have the lead, um, um, the, the liquid type of, you know, of uh, 3D printer, the resin types, where your only additive that you're adding to that is light. Mm-hmm. You know, light and temperature. You know, technically, if you think about it, you know, Ed, correct me if I'm wrong, or correct me if I'm wrong. That light is not considered an additive to the additive manufacturing process. So technically, now you have a miniature additive manufacturing process in your home, on your desk, or in a shop. All right. Now that you know, we're talking about the additive manufacturing side of the house, the additive manufacturing side of the house. You know, Ed, what do you kind of think about when uh, we kind of talk about that from the OT standpoint? So when we're talking additive, we're 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 talking about we're not wasting anything. We're talking subtractive, which is normally what we do today. Say when we're milling a piece of uh, metal, or when we're taking a block of granite and turning it into a sculpture, we're um, removing pieces that we won't use. But additive, we do not u- we do not have that waste. We control the materials we're using. Um, that's that's the main thing with that point. The other the other thing I. There was a few things that struck me with uh, some things that yourself and John said. And uh, one of the things is, uh, John said there are some uh, environmental things that are kind of sometimes hard to control with a 3D printer. Well, with a PID loop, you can actually tune that um, your heating process to a point that you can say, if I go above, then bring me back down. If I go below, then bring me back up. So that is something that could be used inside of a 3D printing application. Mm-hmm. And, and Nick made a, a very good point when he was talking about some of the things you can do with uh, 3D printers as far as the applications. Uh, a few other applications I can think of that come to mind is we can do um, prosthetics for uh, children that are have uh, missing limbs. Uh, we can make those prosthetics uh, intelligent. We can make those pro- prosthetics uh, over the lifetime of the person adjustable yeah. because we can always reprint and learn from the last print. Right. So this is something that I think is a, a very intriguing idea. Um, but I would like to get a, get the perspective from John, yeah. uh, it's, what he thinks. It's actually funny that you mentioned, um, uh, so the Wounded Warrior Project is doing that, which is fantastic for a lot of you know disabled veterans and things like that, getting those um, um, prosthetic limbs for them. Um, and it's a great thing that that they're doing over there with that. Now, uh, digging deeper into it, it's it's crazy because we're getting into a world that's um, ever more connected than it always has been. Um, and we could even touch into the augmented reality part of it mm-hmm. too, uh, because you get that uh, prosthetic limb doesn't have to be technically a, um, a replacement for an am- amputated limb or anything like that. But you can get it to where it will be read and recognized in an, in an augmented reality situation. And you're already moving. That's a 3D printed piece. Now you're moving it and, and you know, it's come full circle. It's back digital again. So it's, it's crazy how, how uh, much application you can have to this piece. And, and, and honestly, the limit is, is, is the person's uh, creativity. Um, of course, and your, your technical know-how, but uh, a quick Google search will get you, you know, most of the way there. Yeah. And a little bit of ingenuity will, you know, maybe a little bit of duct tape will get you the rest of the way there. Yeah. So. You know, and I think it's also a great way to get people into, you know, using AutoCAD and stuff yeah. like that. And that kind of, you know, spins us into, you know, the whole STEM environment where now you start adding AutoCAD into it. You start dealing with STEAM because you're dealing with the arts. You know, 3D printing can be considered an art form inside the STEAM 
um, uh, you know, mentality, you know, as you, as we do a derivative off, off of STEM. But, you know, it's like, if you think about it, you know, that's how things can be, you know, tied together. And then you start thinking about adding in the, the recycling standpoint that we've talked about earlier, you know, on how do you recycle this filament and stuff like that. You know, so the big, qu the big thing is, you know, as we tie in, you know, with that 3D printing stuff, we're talking about the science to make the filament, the technology to build the, the part, you know, the engineering to do the, you know, how that, that model, you know, is supposed to look or function. You know, the arts are the guys who are out there that are actually combining those parts together. And then the math is the guys who are out there doing the G-code. You know, if you think about it, as we tie all that together, you know, we start getting 3D printing. And the funny part is, is 3D printing is a tangible output of STEM. Right. You know, I don't know. I might be the only one who feels that way. But, you know, that's just, you know, my own token, you know, standpoint. Yeah, adding, adding that piece where you're, like, producing something that may not have function. It could just be a sculpture. It could be a vinyl piece on the outside of your house. Um, it could be your house. Like, yeah, it, literally. it's crazy. Yeah, literally <laughs> could be your house, um, as well as every piece that gets printed to, to get put in there. Um, so it, it, it really has so many applications as far as, um, you know, being able to have a, a, a finished product or, or a polished, maybe not completely polished product, but a functional one. Yeah. So, yeah. Definitely vital. So, so for myself, it's uh, ideals become drawings. Drawing becomes uh, wireframes. Wireframes become AutoCAD. AutoCAD become products. So for me, I, I'm a, fu a futuristic type person. I think outside of the box. Uh, I'm a rebel when it comes to staying inside of a, a concept that's been around for 40 or 50 years. I said everybody use AutoCAD. Why can't we use AutoSCAD? And AutoSCAD would be auto scanning, uh, uh, drafting. Yeah. So basically, basically would scan any device, capture all those points with lasers mm -hmm. or infrared or yeah. sound or whatever, whatever medium you want to use in the physical world. You can use. Yeah. You take that and you put that into a system. And why does a person have to sit there and draw these things? Well, the funny part is now, to, 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 not to cut you off or anything like that, but to bring this to to, to, a, to a point, or to give you an idea of what point we're going off of here, you know, you're starting to deal with the fact that you can actually do that with the cell phone. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So. And and in another another point of view, anybody that's done anything with an IDE that's intelligent, it auto completes. Why, if I start. Connecting a few points, it doesn't auto-complete me a hexagon. Right. And then the next time, it auto-completes me the next layer. It auto-completes me the next layer. Because I, I leverage machine learning and artificial intelligence and augmented, re augmented not re reality and all of these things. So it's like a Linux tab complete. Exactly. Why, why, why is that not, not there? Why should the artist be burdened with remedial things? Mm -hmm. Why should the engineer be burdened with remedial things? Why should the inventor be, in, be burdened with physical things from Newton that don't comply or relate to what we do now in this, this time? Yeah, true. Yeah, what's, what's really like stopping you, you know? And, and at the end of the day, a lot of the times it's, it's, it's getting to the point. We talked about it earlier and, and Ed issued a challenge uh, on making um, a printer uh, better than the Ender for, for less than 300 which I, I, I think you can do, but I, I don't, honestly, it's not going to be the easiest thing in the world. It's not mm -hmm. going to be the prettiest thing in the world, but um, I'd like to welcome that challenge, honestly. Uh, and, and yeah, I don't mind putting, putting my Ender up against it either, the one that, you know, the, the baby, the brainchild that's been developed so far, but, but, but don't get me wrong, I, I wouldn't like mind seeing it beat. Um, seeing it, seeing it get done cheaper, there's no reason that uh, it can't be done. As well as there's no reason that going into the future that 3D printers are um, as common as your microwave in your house. There's no yeah. reason it can't get to that point. Yeah, and you know it's like you know when we talk about that challenge and stuff like that. You know I'm I'm gonna all stand behind it. You know something that we can play with. You know we got the the you know be moving forward with the YouTube channel here very very shortly. Mm -hmm. 
you know, everybody seeing these things come out and also, or, you know, come in tech minutes and some other things. So, you know, hey, it's something that we're going to, you know, hit it, you know, full throttle and, uh, you know, see how that goes. You know, but I know, you know, that there's probably, you know, some people on the other end of this that are listening who are, you know, environmentally savvy. We'll put it that way. Um, and they're sitting there, I can hear them back in the background screaming, what about the waste? You know, or, you know, what do you do with the garbage? You know, when you talk about 3D printing. So I think that's where we're going to open up this next point to the recycling standpoint. Because I think that might be where some people say, well, this could just be a waste because all you're doing is wasting plastic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's, it's honestly one of the first things that I thought when, when I started printing because those first few prints were not, were not successful. <laughs> So you have a you got hot a, garbage. Uh, yeah, hot <laughs> garbage. Uh, that's putting it nicely. I have a block of um, just disformed plastic sitting on my print bed. What am I supposed to do with this? Or a spaghetti monster of just thinner plastic? What I can't do anything with that. It's it's too brittle. Um, there are machines um, that you know they can reheat that metal back. You put all that. Make sure you keep the 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 filament the same you're not trying to mix too much pla PEG, uh so on but y you can get those remade back into a um another reusable spool and, and moreover on that piece they've got machines on you know a, a few websites thingiverse i think has it um where i've seen it where it's it's taking these two liter bottles like sprint uh sprite pepsi coke taking these two liter bottles and running them through and making them into spools of filament for you. So it, not only are you being able to reuse any filament that may have been a failed print or um, any filament that you used as a test print, um, you, you're taking and you're reducing waste outside of your realm now. You're, you're yeah. helping in other, other, other fields. So it's it, it, at first it may seem like it's using a lot more, but at the end of the day, um, if it's a print as need basis as well as I can recycle these pieces when they burst or break Then you are minimizing your waste to almost nothing And we have to look at it in the right uh, point of view um, To make aluminum from ore takes a immense amount of power to recycle aluminum from previously uh, Manufactured products doesn't take as much energy, right? It takes heat uh, and the added benefit is, is this is an additive pro process, not as attractive. So there is no waste uh, that's in the process once we get a good product. The product, you know, hits, hits the floor running. Mm -hmm. As opposed to if I have aluminum or any type of metal, there, there will be some, some, uh, some waste. And you have to deal with that waste. If, right. if, if I'm, I'm welding things together, there will be some waste. Yep. And it's an a enormous amount of energy to, to create enough energy to fuse metal together. Uh, so that that's another thing to keep in mind when we're talking about recycling yep. and being environmentally sound. And, and, and for me, when we say being environmentally sound, I say environmentally responsible. Right, exactly. Right. And, you know, I've looked at those, the recyclers, those recyclers are like three grand. You know, there's people out there doing them for, you know, a lot cheaper. They're doing the open source versions. So, you know, if we do, you know, accomplish our goal and that challenge, I think the next, you know, one of the next few projects after that, we'll, we'll have to make ourselves a recycling robot, you know, because I have a feeling we're going to mess up our fair share amount yeah. and pretty much we're not, with a freaking, you know, a cement brick and nothing but plastic. Yeah, you got to crack a few eggs to make an omelet, so. You know, maybe more than just a few. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're going on the dozen, you know, baker's dozen if you're really careful. Um, but. You know, that's just that's just one of those things. You know, and I'm going to go on the probably, I think this will be the last topic for the day, you know, is the, you know, back to that attachment to STEM. And, you know, you, knowing your background, you know, where, how, how, how does that kind of roll into it as far as, you know, STEM into? Oh, man. So I can, uh, I can kind of take a step back to my, my capstone class in college. Um, so fighting four years to get a physics degree is not easy, a lot of long nights, but that capstone was actually, funny enough, uh, a laser engraver 
that would um, we were trying to make from scratch. Um, it's funny because we had an old server cabinet which I know you're familiar with, yeah, <laughs> that was not being so. used. It had some wheels, and we were like, okay, well, here's this. We got a table. Why can't we do this? Um, and it became um, the biggest objections or the biggest thing, um, like roadblocks for us, was these pieces, there's not, you can't go to uh, Lowe's and buy this connector piece that's going to withstand this wattage or this voltage. Um, you can't go to the store that's going to get this specific, like, connector piece um, eventually you could but it's not going to fit the way that you need it to for the tubing or whatever you're trying to do because we needed a water cooling system we were actually 3D printing with resin already at the university and we printed these connections and these pieces to get that, um, that laser engraver up and running on site minimizes your cost as well as it teaches everybody how to get those things and you know what the teacher didn't make it easy for us we had to model that too, and prove to them why this one was structural sound versus, you know, maybe one that's less infill or one that has a different type of infill, grid versus gyro and hexagon, star, whatever pattern you want to use. Um, and and honestly, safety was a big part of all of that as well. So um, printing a piece that will fit, do the job, and is safe to be around as well as safe to use. You don't have to worry about a critical failure causing you injury. Mm -hmm. It's it's game changing. Yeah. Lasers. Yeah. Um. So you know, I'll let Ed, you know, lead us out on this one. So. So, so as uh, like I said, it's always uh, interesting to get different perspectives, and for me, uh, when we start talking three three D printing, we're talking STEM. For me, it's connecting the physical to the virtual, and connecting the virtual to the physical. It's allowing a kid to take the, um, I would say it's almost become an attachment now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's one of our limbs now. Mm -hmm. Our cell phones, our technology yeah. has become part of the human psyche. Um, but it allows a kid to take concepts and physically realize the thing that was in their brain. Yeah. This is important when we talk STEM. STEM is not um, projects and uh, making a molecule model or putting Lego together and making it uh, mechanized. That's not STEM. STEM is developing concepts and teaching people how to use scientific methodology to solve problems, to make things, to make things easier, better, or to uh, actually turn a thing into something that no one thought it could mm -hmm. become. Uh, that, that's my point. And with that, I, I would like to say the $300 3D <laughs> printer challenge is coming. Yeah. I'm game on. Not afraid, not worried. However, uh, we appreciate everybody listening. We appreciate all the support. And if you have any comments, any ideas, or if you want to throw out another challenge, we're open to any challenges you guys want to throw at us. Yep. And as always, thank you. Yep. Thank you for listening to the Tech at Lunch podcast, where we hope you learned something about tech during your break or during your lunchtime. If you did, please give us a follow to prevent missing future episodes. If you have any ideas or something you want to hear or learn about, please send us a show idea to podcast at vulcanora.com. Hope you have a good rest of the day and continue learning.